Звезды мировой пластической хирургии с Ольгой Засеевой. Эстетика в разрезе. Деннис Хаммонд, США. Легенда пластической хирургии. Профессор, доктор медицины. Автор более ста научных работ по мамопластике и контурной пластике тела. Один из самых известных и авторитетных специалистов в своей области. Эстетика в разрезе. Is it more people now willing, more ladies willing now to do the breast surgery than before? Well, I think that nowadays with the advent of social media, patients are much more well informed and they know which questions to ask and how to find the right doctor for them. And that also adds to the, in, the better results that I think that they're getting. It's interesting. What did they ask when, when you come for the consultancy? Well, they have already researched me by the time they're sitting in front of me. Um, they've talked to Dr. Google and uh, there are many reviews that are out there and they've also researched the procedure they're interested in. So they're very well aware of the various techniques that are available for whatever procedure they're looking for. And so they have a good idea what they want even before they come through the door. So at that point then it's just building a relationship between the doctor and the patient so that you can move forward with a successful procedure. So did they ask for your advice or they come and say, okay, I would like this size? And that's it, or it's a discussion. I think they're definitely looking for my advice, but it's also very comforting for them if I say what they already know. So that makes them much more uh, comfortable with the whole process. And they know about the product, they know about the procedure? Uh, they know about the procedures. Sometimes they don't know quite as much about the different products or the different types of implants that are available. And that's where we do a lot of uh, educating ourselves. So what, what are the major questions about the implants they're asking? Uh, a lot of them uh, are interested in information concerning the difference between a round implant and a gummy bear implant, or the teardrop anatomic shaped implant. These days, a lot of people are coming in with questions about smooth implants versus textured implants. And in particular, the issue of the anaplastic large cell lymphoma. And then as well, a breast implant illness. They want to know about that as well, because there's a lot of that out in social media right now. Звезды мировой пластической хирургии с Ольгой Засеевой. Эстетика в разрезе. Гуру мамопластики, профессор Денис Хаммонд. We have a very famous uh, lady. She took off the implants and then she made a publicity out of this uh, procedure and then we started to receive from our um, colleagues, doctors, information that the patients want to take off implants and not to replace them. Um, this is a little bit stressful for, for industry, let's say, and for, uh, for understanding um, why and uh, what is the reason. Do you have the same issue with your patients uh, who are just afraid of implants? Uh, yeah. Yes, this is stressful for everyone all around the world. This issue of implant removal for these, what are oftentimes very vague and uh, ill-defined symptoms. So uh, there are many people, uh, myself included, that are somewhat skeptical about whether or not these are actual diseases. So it can create a very uncomfortable situation where you're doing an operation to treat a disease that may not actually exist. We just don't know for sure. So this is where it's going to be very important that we continue to do research uh, and get to the bottom of this problem. Uh, in the meantime, this is where you can counsel patients and try to help them make good decisions uh, for their health and their appearance. Эстетика в разрезе. 
Then is what is the future of the, let's say, breast surgery in the near future? Is it going to be like 3D printer where you could modeling the breast and then you don't need a plastic surgeon? I think, no, you're always going to need a plastic surgeon. But we are going to get much better at this. And I think one of the areas that will make a lot of advancement is in what's called regenerative medicine. So there could come a day when we could grow the patient's own tissues in a laboratory and put them back, like with fat grafting, to accomplish our reconstructive needs. I think we'll also someday have much better breast implants. We may well in the future look back and say, do you remember those old days when we used silicone gel breast implants? Because now we have this. So I think these advancements will just continue and continue on through the years. And I hope, it is my dream, to live another 30 years because I can't wait to see what happens in the future and what we're going to have. Aesthetica в разрезе. It's interesting. What, what do you think could be done instead of the implants? Um, I think it should be something which will be covered by protecting borders. Yes, that's where the regenerative medicine comes in. We'll be able to perhaps wrap the implants with a material that's very cell-friendly to the patient so that the body doesn't recognize it as a foreign object. That'll eliminate a lot of the problems that we've had with breast implants like caps or contracture and infection and complications like that. We're almost there. I can use an implant-based breast reconstruction now uh, in a lady with breast cancer, use that implant in combination with the patient's own fat and some matrices, some meshes inside the breast to do some amazing work uh, and accomplish very good results uh, in breast reconstruction. Звезды мировой пластической хирургии с Ольгой Засеевой. Эстетика в разрезе. Гуру мамопластики профессор Денис Хаммонд. The question is important. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, in the auditorium questions to you. And do you have anyone in uh, you could ask the question or you need, if you need, for instance, anyone to whom you trust, anyone which opinion is important for you, do you from your colleagues? One of the great advantages that I've had is that I have friends now all over the world. Some of the best plastic surgeons in the world. If I ever have a problem, I can call them up and say, have you ever seen this before? What do you think that I should do in this particular situation? How often it happen in your practice? Uh, not very often, just a couple of times over the years. But I can tell you a funny story. Yeah. I was at a very a well-known meeting in the United States about the breast, one of the biggest breast meetings in the world. And I was at the faculty dinner. So I was in the room with 30 of the best plastic surgeons in the world. And my daughter sent me an emergency text. She had splashed some hot oil cooking oh, on her forward, forehead and she had a burn. So I showed the picture to 30 of the most famous plastic surgeons in the world and I said, what do you think? Should we do something? And fortunately she was fine. We didn't need to do anything else. But that was a lot of fun because I sent her a text back. I said, well, I have an opinion from the best plastic surgeons in the world that you're going to be okay. <laughs> so that was kind of a fun little story about how you've been able to develop relationships with people around the world that uh, can really work to your advantage. Aesthetica в разрезе. If you will be uh, making a composition of the woman, what kinds, uh, what size of implants you will say think will be ideal for the young new model well i i do think that the the breast like i said visually it just evokes all kinds of emotions artistic emotions and it does have to have some form to it so it's so difficult we call breasts you know b cup c cup D cup. I think the ideal breast, to put it in terms of patients, would be a full C. I think that sets off the proportion to the rest of the body very well, and that's what I would shoot for. In the United States, that would be somewhere around a 300 to a 325 cc implant most times. Do they often follow your uh, guidelines to suggest this kind of volume, or they say, no, doctor, we would like more? Nope, most times they'll listen to me. 
because they know that that uh, of all of the people that are in the room, I'm the expert. So tell me about the patients. It's an interesting question for me because if they go, for instance, uh, to your practice and then they choose, they go to another different uh, doctors as well and they don't choose you, they choose another doctor. But then when it's failure, they come back to you and uh, they ask, oh, please, Dr. Hammond, could you make something to make it better? Will you double charge for this one or? Uh, or you, you, will you do this? Will you try well, to? Uh, number one, will I do the procedure if I think that I can help? And I would never dream of double charging somebody just because they went somewhere first. Because think about it, here's a patient who is suffering, they've had a complication, and it's another human being. So we have an obligation to try to, to help those people. So the charge for surgery is what it is, no matter where they come from. So complication doesn't cost more than, let's say? Oh, you know, sometimes if it's a really involved case, they can be quite expensive. But we don't ever adjust the charge because they, I was their second choice. They need to think about going to see somebody who is properly trained, has experience and is going to be able to do a good job for them the first time. The minute they start looking at price and trying to say in the United States we have many people who will fly to Mexico cool. because it's very cheap to have surgery there. Well, cheap surgery, cheap result. And then when they have their complications they come back and of course now it's going to cost them two or three times as much to have the problem fixed. So if they had just had the procedure done with a well-trained person in the first place, they would have been much better off. Звезды мировой пластической хирургии с Ольгой Засеевой. Эстетика в разрезе. Гуру мамопластики профессор Денис Хаммонд. When did you feel that you would like to share your experience and your knowledge? From the very beginning. Really, because I have a lot of cases when I ask doctor to be our mentor or to participate in any meetings to teach and they told me no, we don't want to, to tell our secrets. Oh, no, yeah. not at all, no. So you are, you are happy to share? Oh, it's right in the Hippocratic Oath. This is an oath that you take as a doctor. So, because we're terrible businessmen. We give away all our secrets because that's what we're supposed to do. If I've learned something or have developed a technique that helps patients, it's my job to tell that to everybody else so they can help their patients. That's just the way that we're supposed to react as doctors. And then what about competition? If someone will be doing the same as you are doing, then? I hope they do it better. From the yesterday uh, session, what was the most uh, fun or interesting question from the auditorium? from the Russians. Oh, no, I remember exactly because one of the things that I've tried to teach the surgeons here at the Moscow breast meeting was the importance of the lower pole arc of the breast. Yeah, it's the biggest question. Do we need to go lower or not and how to save? Exactly. And one of the Russian surgeons asked, what about the patient where the skin is going to stretch? So does that mean I need to make an adjustment in the lower pole arc? And the, the answer, of course, is yes. But I really like that question because that told me that they were understanding what I was trying to teach. Uh, and that is always uh, satisfying as an educator, knowing that the, the message you're trying to, to give people is being received. So that was fun. Aesthetica в разрезе. So what will be your then suggestion for the, uh, for the doctors? Always go to meetings, always talk to colleagues, always question yourself. How can I do better? The best compliment that I was ever given was somebody once said of me that I would never take no for an answer, but I would also never take yes for an answer. And that means that no matter how well I did, with a particular case, I was always striving to do better. And that's a good philosophy for life. So how many procedures are you doing per week in your OR? Yeah, in my office, in my practice, I typically will do anywhere from six to eight procedures a week. Wow. But it's very busy. They're very busy days. And, uh, and then, of course, I go to many meetings 
such as this, the Moscow Breast Meeting. I go to meetings all over the, all over the earth, all over the world. And that's how you get to be a better surgeon, because you get exposed to different ideas and, and different philosophies of plastic surgery. So in your practice, the patients who are willing to, to do the cosmetic, is it 50-50 or it's more reconstructive patients? How did you choose them or they choose you? Well, for me, uh, in my practice, I'm about 50% cosmetic but 50% reconstructive as well. And I try to maintain that reconstructive side of my practice, again, just because I enjoy it so much. It really is a privilege to be able to work with these ladies and help them recover from breast cancer. So how do you, I mean, make fun in your art? Do you listen to music? Oh, yeah, always. We, we, we listen to music, uh, every case, really? yes, yes. Classic rock. Classic, okay, super, super. Звезды мировой пластической хирургии с Ольгой Засеевой. Эстетика в разрезе.